Okay, great. So let's get started. So hello everyone. My name is Maya Schoenbach and I'm a clinical psychologist in training. And today we're going to be exploring the role of technology in uh, managing body-focused repetitive behaviors or BFRBs. Um, so really in recent years, technology has started playing a bigger and bigger role in uh, the field of mental health. And today I'm gonna to talk uh, about its application specifically in managing skin picking and hair pulling disorders or BFRB, uh, BFRBs. So I'll talk about some of the new technology and some of the research um, that's surrounding it in um, skin picking and hair pulling disorders. And if you have any questions or comments, really, I want to encourage that. Uh, so I suggest that you just write them in in the chat in Zoom, and then we'll answer them all at the end of the presentation all at once. So if you think of anything throughout, write it in, in the chat, and then um, we'll go through them at the end with a dedicated Q&A session. Okay. So what are we going to talk about today? We'll start off by talking about uh, some internet-based therapies. So I'll give some examples of different programs. Um, we'll talk a little bit about self-guarded versus therapist-assisted um, internet-based therapy. Uh, then we'll move on to talking about mobile apps, um, things that are really good for tracking uh, your urges, your picking episodes, your pulling episodes. Um, and things that are used for self-awareness. Um, we'll talk about some wearable devices. This is a really new uh, kind of trend in uh, technology for BFRB um, management. So we'll talk about that in some research um, for real-time kind of monitoring. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about stimulus control and devices. So we'll talk briefly about this technique of stimulus control. Um, and we'll really share some, some use, useful tools and technologies that are, are suggested for this um, that can support it. And we'll talk about some future directions, so some up and coming uh, technology that maybe is recently being worked on and, and some potential future applications. Uh, and then we'll have, like I said, a Q&A session at the end. Uh, and today's webinar is probably going to be about 40 minutes, uh, but with Q&A uh, Q we can have until around around 8 o'clock. Uh, sorry, 1 p.m. <laughs> time zone. Okay, so first let's talk about internet-based therapies. Um, and then we'll start talking a little bit about mobile apps that can either support the therapy or used really as independent tools. Okay, so um, studies estimate research shows that between 74 to 85 percent of people with trichotillomania or which is hair pulling disorder or excoriation disorder which is skin picking disorder they don't receive the proper treatment so this could be because of various barriers to treatment so some common ones that are, are rec uh, recorded in the literature uh, is first of all uh, shame so some people still feel uh, feel shame about, about their disorder, feel shame maybe about uh, asking for help, for treatment. Um, people feel stigma about going to a therapist and receiving treatment, even though we're in 2023 and mental health um, has become more and more common uh, in, to be discussed and to be going to a therapist. There still is a lot of stigma about uh, receiving treatment. Uh, there could be a lack of knowledge, both uh, on the side of the individual, and maybe they don't know uh, that they're having a, men a mental health disorder and that they should be asking or could be asking for help. Um, but there's also a lack of, of knowledge on the side of, of a lot of therapists. It really is um, a specific a specific disorder with, that requires specific expertise um, and training. And some clinicians really lack knowledge um, about how to treat these very specific disorders. There's also uh, geographic um, limitations um, accessing a therapist, especially the fact that it's such a specific um, treatment, maybe therapists don't live near you, um, and then also economic factors. Let's be real, therapy is expensive. Um, so the, all of these things really may hinder um, the, the access to, to treatment. 
So studies have shown that internet-based uh, behavioral therapy is associated with a significant symptom reduction for skin picking and hair pulling disorder. So here I'm showing some examples of uh, uh, help of internet-based therapy. So stoppilling.com and stoppicking.com. These are examples of self-help here, self-help internet-based therapy. So in uh, self-help internet-based therapy, the user goes through various online sessions uh, on their own, and then they're able to interact with the, with the content that's online. So maybe you'll be uh, reading different things to learn about the, the disorder, maybe answering different questions, um, reflecting on certain, uh, on the content, but really you're on your own with the therapy. And then there's something called therapist-guided uh, internet-based therapy. And so for an example, there's skin pick and trick stop uh, that we provide. Um, and uh, in therapist-guided, uh, you go through the, the different online sessions and you're supported every step of the way by a therapist. So for example, if you're answering a reflection question or something about your personal, your personal um, uh, picking or pulling symptoms, then your therapist will read your answers and they'll respond directly to you. And then by doing this, the therapist also can customize the program to your specific individual needs. But this again is all done online on the internet. So you can access this from anywhere in the world. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on your, on your computer, but it really gives you the freedom of doing it online. Um, typically, these therapies, they really follow something called HRT or habit reversal training. And this is considered the first line recommended treatment, really the gold standard uh, of treatment for BFRBs, for skin picking and, and hair pulling. Um, but these, these, technique, uh, these therapies, they also incorporate other techniques. So uh, for example, in skin pick and trick stop, there are different customizable tools um, that uh, allow you to to access different techniques also. So things like mindfulness techniques, um, things like goal setting. Um, so these are also different tools that are within the uh, online therapy program. So now let's talk about some apps. So there's lots of different apps out there that are designed to help people, um, first of all, break habits. Um, things that help you can track your hair pulling or skin picking. Um, and ultimately these apps are, are designed to help you gain insight into your, to your behavioral patterns. So they can provide data on, on triggers, on frequency, on severity, um, and really make you become more self-aware. And then that can inform your decisions about your treatment. So uh, tracking is a really important thing in, um, in terms of treating skin picking and hair pulling disorder. So apps that, um, you, that allow you to do this um, really begin to make you more aware of your picking or pulling episodes. And that really is the first step in treating the behavior. Um, apps, most, uh, most apps, they um, analyze the data that you input. And then they can provide you insights into your behaviors by giving you a summary statistics. Um, and um, they can also uh, provide you insights into your, your triggers. And understanding your triggers really can help you in, in underlying different underlying emotional or situational factors that could contribute to your picking and pulling. So for example, um, once you start monitoring and tracking your picking and pulling episodes uh, using an app, you might all of a sudden notice that you pick or pull more frequently um, while you're watching TV or while you're driving. Um, and then that's really important knowledge to have when you're beginning treatment. So you can really direct a more energy into these specific times and you're more aware before you go to drive or before you're about to watch TV. And then you can kind of fine tune things and, and customize your therapy specifically for, uh, based on this knowledge. 
Um, and then also, if you have um, this overview or the, the statistics of your behavioral patterns, it's really useful to show to your therapist. And I'll, I'll talk about this a little uh, in a little bit. Um, so progress tracking and goal setting um, is also really useful. So often in, in some apps, you can set a specific goal. Um, so for example, maybe to reduce the frequency of your, of your picking or pulling episodes, maybe to reduce the duration of them. And then using apps, you can really um, track your progress. And then this can maybe help you build your motivation. Um, you can celebrate like a milestone and, and give you really a sense of accomplishment. And that also maintains your, your, your progress. Um, so reminders and notifications are also really important. So apps can send you reminders uh, to prompt you to maybe engage in coping techniques. So for example, breathing techniques or, or mindfulness uh, techniques, um, or also to track your, uh, uh, you can get a notification to track uh, your behaviors. So whether or not you picked or pulled in the past hour, for example. Um, so really these prompts uh, encourage consistency, and that's really important. Um, and then through that, you can have you can gain more self awareness and self self reflection through that too. So finally, in terms of integrating with therapy, um, many apps really complement traditional therapy approaches. So, like I said, the insight that you get gain from collecting all this data. Um, can really inform the, the discussions that you have with your therapist. So you can share the data that you have with your therapist and then that really allows for a collaborative approach um, in, in sessions. Okay, so now I wanna show um, a couple of examples for habit tracking apps. So Habit Now, as seen on the left, this is really popular among Android users. So there is a, paid plan, but I've read that a free plan, it really is sufficient for most people. Um, and really this app allows you to track habits, uh, daily habits, weekly and monthly. And you can really set it to what days you want um, each habit to repeat on if you wanna continue doing it. So for example, if you wanna um, meditate every day or do some sort of form of mindfulness technique every day to start improving your awareness, you can build that habit. Um, you can um, mark things as completed or not. So also say you wanna track how many days you didn't pick or pull, you can also mark it as that. Um, and Habit Now um, really does a summary of your statistics of all your habits. So for example, it'll show you um, your current habit streak, the completion rate um, and things like that, the completions over the last week. Um, so that's a, a cool and popular app for uh, Android users. And then in terms of iPhone users, um, a common app that I've uh, seen is called Streaks. Um, and it's not free. I believe it does cost $5 to download, but it really is a popular app among iPhone users. And like in its name, it's based on the idea of building and maintaining a habit streak. So the app also allows you to track daily, weekly, monthly habits. And you can really set it so habits have to be done a certain number of days per week or per month or on specific days of the week. And then you can also have them recurring multi uh, uh, multiple times a day so that you have to check it off if you've done it. Um, so for example, whether or not you engaged in picking or pulling in the morning, afternoon, or evening, that's uh, something that you can uh, set in the app. And then also a uh, cool feature is that they have a uh, an option for note taking. So this kind of adds context uh, to tracking your habit. So that might be good for um, talking about the situational or the con uh, contextual uh, triggers that are around you. Um, so now I wanna talk about habit apps in the literature. So there's a group, uh, uh, Stawars, Cox and Blanford in 2015, they released a study that they reviewed 115 different habit tracking app, or habit formation apps, sorry. And they reported among these 115 apps, the most popular feature that you can see here uh, was task tracking. So in other words, it's reporting whether or not the task was completed or not. 
um, and that was available in 77% uh, of the apps. Um, other things that were included were uh, goal setting um, to achieve specific habits. So they talked about the idea of maybe taking a giant, a big goal and breaking it down to smaller habits. So they gave the example of uh, writing a book. Um, and then the, sm the smaller habits were waking up early every day, writing for an hour every day, things like that. And so that was uh, 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 in 35% um, of the apps. Um, and then uh, something interesting that they talked about was that research shows that uh, trigger events or contextual cues um, and also positive re reinforcement really support habit formation. So those are three things that they talked about. Um, and the most important thing there is that the idea of trigger events. So that means that things that exist in your routine, um, they can be used as prompts to engage in a certain behavior. So this can be, uh, and this is, has been shown to be the best way to build a habit rather than completing it at a specific time. So for example, what does that mean? For example, um, taking medication after breakfast is generally easier to do to form that habit of taking medication than remembering to meditate every day at 10 p.m. So rather than doing it at a specific time, sometimes we forget, things get in the way, but having it associated with something that's already in your daily routine, so we call it a contextual uh, uh, trigger event in a contextual cue, that has been shown to be more um, effective in habit formation. And so uh, this group, when they did a review of all of these apps, they only found that 3% here were focused on um, um, helping people define these contextual cues and fitting the new habit into their daily routine. So that's not very promising. Um, kind of showing that these habit apps maybe aren't looking at the psychological literature and it's maybe it's it's important that they, they did provide some recommendations for app development. So hopefully in the future, um, there will be more uh, apps in this uh, domain using this uh, knowledge. So now I wanna talk about SkinPick and TrickStop apps. So these apps here, I'm showing uh, just the SkinPick app but um, the trick stop app for trichotillomania is um, very similar. So uh, essentially these apps, they have a, we have a free version for them and they really uh, offer a wide range of different resources and tools uh, to kind of start your, your journey for, for uh, treating your uh, skin picking or, or uh, hair pulling disorder. So, the, the apps provide, um, first of all, education. So they give you a, a deeper understanding of skin picking disorder, of hair pulling disorder, but its causes, its triggers, um, also associated conditions. Um, and they provide some first steps that you can take uh, based off of evidence-based treatment strategies. Uh, so first steps that you can take on your own. So if we go back to talking about uh, the internet-based therapy, this is self-guided. Um, as opposed to it's not with a therapist um, in the free version of these apps. Um, they, these apps also offer self-assessment. So um, you can assess uh, the severity of your skin picking or hair pulling disorder um, and really use this as a baseline to measure your progress as you continue. Um, and then you can also monitor, uh, like we talked about the tracking. So you can monitor your picking or pulling episodes. So that's what you kind of see here. Um, you can uh, see their duration, their intensity over time. Um, and like I said earlier, um, in doing this, you'll really become more aware of your specific picking or pulling patterns, which is such a crucial element um, in overcoming the disorder. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about some wearable devices. And these devices really off offer um, it's, it's promising because they offer opportunities for real-time monitoring of your picking or pulling behaviors. So essentially these devices are equipped with sensors to detect and track your BFRB um, movements, related movements, so the picking or the pulling. 
Um, and they, this can provide really valuable data for your know, personalized intervention um, and maybe even probing the, the urges in real time. So the first uh, device I want to talk about is done by Habit Aware. And so they have a bunch of different devices, but a popular one is called Keen, if you've heard of it. Um, and these devices, they provide what they call just-in-time notifications. So that happens when the use when the uh, when the bracelet uh, detects like a BFRB motion. Um, and ideally, this notification, like a vibration, um, it's ideally there to stop the person from picking or pulling. So they conducted uh, Steed and colleagues in 2022 conducted a pilot study. Um, on this device. And uh, in the study, they actually use a prototype of the, the bracelet and they did it in conjunction. So also using the bracelet and using an app with uh, habit reversal training or HRT. And so uh, what happens is initially the device is set into training mode. And so the person goes about their life, the person using the, the bracelet goes about their life. And then um, the, the bracelet is, is uh, enabled to detect um, uh, specific picking or pulling behavior. And then um, once it's been trained on this, then you can set it into a detection mode. And then um, the detection algorithm, it's all the time in real, real time, updating and continuously comparing the live data that's go about with the person going about their life and wearing the bracelet um, and comparing it to the training data to see if a picking or pulling uh, motion was detected. Um, and it's all done using a motion sensor. So uh, essentially the device vibrates when the, the, the device detects that you're doing a picking or pulling. So what the study did was they divided um, 15 adult women uh, that were diagnosed with trichotillomania into two groups. They had a device and app group, so using this HRT app. And then they also had a control group, which is really important, using a reminder bracelet. And this, um, this reminder bracelet looked exactly like the, the uh, motion sensor bracelet, but instead it just vibrated randomly at 12 times throughout the day. And they said that this, this vibration was just to remind them not to engage in hair pulling. So the, the device and app group, they were sub, supposed, it was uh, supposed to, using the algorithm, vibrate only when they were hair pulling and versus randomly 12 times throughout the day. And so the results of the pilot study showed that both groups demonstrated significant reduction in hair pulling. So that's really good news. However, there weren't, weren't any significant differences between the two conditions. So that's a little disappointing considering that they're trying to test their, their, their device. So the authors talked about um, different reasons for maybe the lack of the difference between the groups. And the first thing was they said was that there were a lot of false positives um, in the group with the, with the bracelet, with the motion detecting bracelet. And so um, essentially maybe, for example, the, the person might have put on like a hat and then because the person raised their hand towards their head, it might have detected and then buzzed. Or they went to say hello, and then it was close to their head and then it buzzed. And so if the person wearing it gets a lot of false positives, gets a lot of buzzes, when it's not actually, they're not actually hair pulling, then they might start to ignore it. And so the author said that maybe that could be a reason why there wasn't such a huge difference between the two groups. And what they said is that they could uh, potentially try and improve their algorithm for detecting the specific hair pulling um, uh, behavior. Another thing they said was that the study was only over four weeks. Um, and so also a lot of the, the participants didn't complete all the HRT modules. So they said maybe they could uh, conduct a study that was longer and try and see if there were any differences with that. And then finally, the study had a really small sample size. Uh, it was only 15 women. It was also only women, also only with trichotillomania. So ideally they would, they would conduct a larger study with more diversity, um, maybe include skin picking as well and see if that could um, 
create any uh, differences, significant differences between the two groups. So another device that's uh, popular is called the Pavlov device. So this is um, a behavior training device and it's designed to help people break habits in general. Um, so they say uh, like changing your sleep habits or drinking more water. Um, and they also mention uh, that it's useful for BFRDs, so for uh, skin to hear hair loss. So how does it work? Um, it vibrates this time. The vibration is to reward good behavior. So if you're not, if you say you want to drink water, if, if you drink water, it vibrates. Um, and then it uses an electric stimulus or a little shock to help train away bad behavior. So that's why they have the little lightning bolt here. Um, so this device has a bunch of different features like um, habit tracking and, and different alarms. Um, and it also uses this hand detection um, feature that they use an accelerometer uh, to monitor uh, the specific uh, behaviors. So for example, BFRBs. Um, so again, it's based off of motion here. It's also with acceleration. So I guess the speed of it as well. Um, it's really important for me to say that there is currently no scientific research uh, on this device. Um, and so, this concept of, of behavior training um, through positive and negative feedback, it could hold promise for uh, treating BFRBs, but really the effectiveness and the safety of it for, managed, for treating BFRBs um, with this device, it hasn't been scientifically established. So really further research needs to be done, new studies need to be done um, to really understand the potential benefits and the limitations of this of this device for specifically for addressing the affirmations. That's really important. Um, and then finally, in terms of uh, uh, wearable devices, a group called the Matter Lab, they created also another wrist device and they call it Tingle. And this includes um, a thermal sensory measurement detection. And so, um, the, in their paper, they did a study in 2019 uh, with Sun and colleagues, and they claimed that since the habit aware and the Pavlov devices, they only rely on this motion detection. Um, so they said that this could cause um, difficulty in really in determining the hand position relative to the head because they don't have the initial uh, reference position of the head. So remember what I said about the hat, putting on the hat, and then it, it maybe had a false vibration, false positive, or when they said hello, and they missed the head, and it's still, maybe the brace is still vibrated. Um, it's not, it's hard to distinguish the, the clinically relevant gesture of the BFRB from a day-to-day -day activity. You want to be able to say hello and put on hats. You know, just really important. <laughs> um, so what this group did was they conducted um, a pilot study to really to investigate the efficacy of this tingle bracelet. And um, they uh, really wanted to see how effective it was at, at distinguishing the different locations um, of the, the behaviors of the hair pulling and the, the skin picking. And they wanted to see if this thermal sensory uh, of in the Tingle device, if it, if it was valuable um, in improving the detection of the BFRBs and really monitoring uh, or, or detecting the BFRBs over just the, the motion detection, the motion detection data alone in the, that was seen in the um, habit or. So their study included 39 um, healthy adult participants. So these were people without skin picking or hair pulling disorders, um, but they simulated the repetitive behaviors um, while wearing the Tingle device. So that's also a limitation of the study that it's not done on a clinical population. That's really important uh, to know. But the results of the study um, were promising. So the results of the study showed that the thermal data that was included in Tingle device um, significantly increased the ability of it to determine um, the target, and it boosted the accuracy of really de of detecting the picking or pulling location on the body. So what they did was they had six different targets on the face, on the head, right? 
and it was the using the Tingle device, they were much more uh, accurate at determining if it was uh, correctly on target on one of the six targets or correctly determining if it was um, off target on one of the remaining five targets or off the bottom suit, let's say. Um, and they showed that without the thermal data, there was a lot more variability in uh, the detection. So essentially what this group showed was that with the Tingle bracelet, they were more accurately able to discriminate between the different hand, the hand gestures. So between clinically relevant gestures like the VFRVs from daily activities. And this is really important when you think about how a device should be able to differentiate between VFRVs and day-to-day -day motions. Okay, so let's talk about stimulus control. So an important aspect of therapy that's really uh, common in treating hair pulling and skin picking disorder is stimulus control. So um, stimulus control is essentially an approach that uh, in which you direct your focus to your external environment and the different factors or triggers that prompt your skin picking or hair pulling. And so in stimulus control, you try to modify your environment in order to limit the exposure to certain triggers so that you can overall, ultimately reduce your urge to engage in the picking or the pulling behavior. So now I want to talk about some uh, devices and technologies that can really help with stimulus control. Okay, so for the first one, um, I want to talk about uh, lockbox inhalers. So often people that suffer from hair pulling or skin picking disorders, they find that mirrors, having mirrors around their house, really are often triggers for, for picking or for pulling. And so a way to combat this is to limit the amount of mirrors that are around your house. So some people find it helpful to only keep a small compact mirror, like a makeup mirror um, in your house for getting ready in the morning. And then what you can do is you can put it into this lock box um, for 24 hours or until you need it the next morning. And so what you do is you just put it inside, you close it, you set the, uh, the time for whenever you want. So for the next day, say in the morning, or if you come back from work or whatever, and you want to get ready again in the evening and you want to look, um, you set it and then it locks. And then you can't open it up and you don't have access to it until the uh, specified time. Um, so this really can help you um, in sticking to your commitments in, in making changes to your habits. Um, and um, in terms of a full length mirror, people uh, that use this, I've, I've suggested maybe putting a full length mirror in a common area of the home um, so that if, if your trigger is a mirror and, and that you go to it in private in order to pick or pull, and if it's in a common area, you may not be uh, so tempted to do so. Um, or to maybe put it in an area in like a basement a um, full length mirror so that you have to actively like go through a process to get there. Um, so it kind of hinders your ease of access. Um, and I really do want to say also that um, stimulus control, it doesn't help you, it, it won't help you stop the urge, but it really can help you initially become more aware of it, of the urges. And then you can use that to begin to understand what these urges mean and why you experience them. And then potentially through therapy, you can begin to um, um, understand why, and then ideally the urges won't go down. So another cool technology that can be used also for uh, mirror reduction um, is something called smart glass. So smart glass is a special type of glass that is able to um, change its reflective properties. So there's this technology that allows, that you can put on glass that allows it to switch from clear to frosted glass or to opaque just by clicking a button um, or using also your smartphone. So it's this type of film that you can really put on any glass, like a mirror or any glass. Um, and so as part of stimulus control, you can really use this film on all of your mirrors at home. And then you need to plug, it's, it's, uh, it, you, it's 
it needs electricity. So you need to plug in this specific smart glass film. And so uh, people have suggested that you can put kind of a lock on the plug with a little combination lock and then maybe give that to a family member who they need to use the mirror also. Um, and then they can modify the, the frosted glass to the clear glass or to the reflective mirror um, whenever they need to and also for you. Um, or you can also give them the smartphone app and then they can turn it on and off and then it kind of limits your access to it and then um, controls the stimulus, stimulus control. Okay, so finally, I want to talk about some future directions. So I'm going to talk just about a couple of projects and therapies uh, related to technology that are just starting to be developed and might be accessible and, and useful um, in the near future. So this is a really cool project that was done in 2019 by a group from the University of California, San Francisco. Um, and they built a chatbot that they called Tricky. <laughs> um, and this really was to help uh, with Abbott Reversal Training or HRT, specifically for trichotillomania. So the chatbot includes a bunch of different questions uh, for self-monitoring. So here you can see on the left, where are you right now at work? Where are you pulling from? Eyebrows. Um, and then it also has a dashboard um, to display a breakdown of the behavior analysis. So for example, showing where the user um, most frequently was pulling. So here you can see at home. Um, and then also there is um, short breathing exercises that have these cute GIFs, the GIFs, however you say, um, in the chatbot. And then something cool is that the therapist can uh, access it and configure and ultimately personalize the chatbot. So maybe including your name, things like that. But also they can modify it easily for other disorders. So it's trichotillomania to skin picking um, disorder isn't that big of a jump. And then they also suggested for uh, substance abuse disorders, which are also uh, use habit reversal training, which is uh, interesting. Um, again, this is really important for me to say, there haven't been any scientific studies that haven't been researched. Um, and this project really is in its early stages. I don't believe it's available yet for the public, um, but it's a cool project that's been worked on. Um, and now I wanna talk a little bit about virtual reality or VR uh, exposure therapy. So virtual reality exposure therapy, it really is uh, a really cool, uh, therapeutic approach that uses VR to essentially immerse a person into a computer generated environment. And these environments are meant to simulate um, different environments that people are typically are afraid of and need to be exposed to in order to um, work on their fears or urges. So um, there have been many studies uh, conducted on using VR exposure therapy. So the main ones have been used for phobias, um, also for uh, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, and also for social anxiety disorder. It's, uh, there's been many studies. Um, there have also been some studies that investigated obsessive compulsive and related disorders in, um, in uh, VR exposure therapy. So obsessive compulsive and uh, related disorders include OCD uh, or obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, hoarding disorder, body dysmorphic disorder. So these are all under this family of obsessive compulsive and related disorders. But two other disorders in this family are also skin picking and hair pulling disorders. So there haven't been, as of now, any studies done using VR exposure therapy for these two disorders. But um, this technology could potentially be used uh, for a controlled exposure to environments that trigger VFRBs, but to do it in a controlled manner. So this could, um, that could be done like with a therapist. And so in doing it in that way, you can really gradually confront and manage your urges while in this environment. It's not a real environment, it's not, you're not really, for example, drive, like we said, if you're driving, you could be fake driving or in virtual reality, but your therapist is next to you. Um, 
And then, so essentially what happens in, in VR exposure therapy is the person puts on the VR headset um, and they interact with the, this, the virtual environment. Um, and this environment is supposed to mirror their triggers. Um, and then really it, it's controlled and safe. And so it can um, allow you to gradually confront um, and manage your urges. And so a significant benefit of the, this VR exposure therapy is that it's personalized um, and it's really immersive. So a therapist can tailor um, the different scenarios to match a patient's specific triggers. And then it really can promote this, the, the desensitization um, to these urges and then also the habit reversal, which is what we work on in habit reversal training. So um, potentially this could be a future therapy. So maybe VR could be used um, in therapy for skin picking um, and hair flowing disorders. We don't know. So in conclusion, I just want to do a quick overview of what we talked about today. So we started off talking about some internet-based therapies. Um, we talked about how uh, this can really help overcome a lot of main barriers to treatment um, and how research shows that it's very effective in uh, symptom reduction. And we talked about the difference between self-guided and therapist-assisted uh, uh, therapies. I talked about some mobile apps, so different habit tracking apps, uh, the benefit that it has in terms of behavior insights, um, and how you can use these apps also in conjunction with therapy, that you can really show these insights to your therapist and it really can kind of give a good uh, jump to your therapy. Talked about a bunch, a few different wearable devices. Um, so the main benefit of these is they give you real-time notifications. Um, it could be used for behavioral training like the Pavlov, so in terms of positive and negative reinforcement. Um, and then the Tingle bracelet that uh, used thermal data, and that was ideally, that, that showed that it was um, more accurate in determining uh, BFRB behaviors versus um, everyday uh, uh, device, uh, everyday behavior, uh, behaviors. Um, and then I talked about a couple of stimulus control devices. So the lockbox, so maybe to lock away a compact mirror, that was just one example that you can use it for. Um, and the smart glass that you can put on mirrors at home, um, and it changes from clear to frosted glass. And then some future directions are really the chatbot assisted therapy, uh, tricky, and then VR exposure therapy also. So uh, I want to say thank you to everyone for attending. And now um, if you have any questions, we have some time to uh, go over them. So I'll look um, in the chat there. So Kim, uh, sorry, I'm also going to, I'm going to keep recording now. So um, it's okay with everyone. Um, so the first question was, will the slides be available? This uh, is being recorded and we will post this on our um website as well as on our um as well as on our youtube channels um yes we do have uh the next question is hi uh do you have data on how effective uh is a skin pick system yes it is um on our website there is um different statistics that are shown there i don't want to quote it now because i don't have it uh, in front of my eyes um, but there are, if you look up skinpick.com, you can see the breakdown of the effectiveness of the program. Uh, the next question is, are there any comments on using a microdermal roller on the scalp when an urge come, comes on? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I haven't personally heard about using that but I would consult um, maybe with a therapist. Um, if you sign up for Skin Pick or Trick Stop, then you have access to an individual therapist and then you can um, ask them these specific questions also. Um, but I don't know if it would harm like a microdermal roller on a scalp. Um, the next question is, where could I purchase a Tingle device? I'm not, uh, from what I read, I don't believe it's available yet for uh, in production. Like, I don't think it's available and marketed yet. Um, like, the habit of wearing the, the um, Pavlov device are. Um, but you can look it up 
on the Matter Lab website and see if they have any devices, but I don't believe it's available yet. <laughs> um, the next question is any thoughts on NAC? Um, I'm not an expert in um, medication, so I don't want to um, address that, but if you want, you can um, message um, either me or our support and I can uh, here's my email address um, here, um, and I can verify with you. I can check with our uh, clinical lead um, if that's important to you. Um, the next uh, comment was uh, interesting info. Sad to hear that a lot of these solutions need more research. Agreed. Um, but I think that's always kind of a open-ended thing in research. There's always more and more questions. Um, who or what companies are responsible for Pavlov? That's a really good question. Um, I thought it was the Pavlov was the company, but it's, I'm not sure. If you want me to know, if you want me to double check that, send me an email and then I can get back to you. The next question was, can you list the names of the apps again, please? Thanks. Um, I'll go back to it now. So there really were a bunch of different apps. So first I talked about um, the habit tracking apps. So about habit now for Android and streaks for iPhone. These are more for general tra habit tracking. Um, and then I also mentioned skin pick and trick stop apps that these are specifically for um, skin picking and trick, uh, trick and telemania. Does insurance cover any of these options? Um, great question. Um, so in terms of skin pick and trick stop, uh, I know that insurance unfortunately does not cover because they are um, text-based um, treatment. Um, and typically insurance does not cover, but I would, you could always check with your provider. Um, maybe there's an exception for that. Um, another question is, is there evidence of, on the effectiveness of neurofeedback for skin picking disorder? It's actually a really interesting question. I did see some articles about that. Um, maybe we could do that as a webinar in the future. I would need to do some more research about that. Um, but that definitely is a field of research. I know it's been used for, um, a lot of different mental health disorders, um, so I can look into it and we could maybe do a whole webinar on that. It's a great question. Um, another question is, do you have data about what is the most effective solution for someone who has trichotillomania for 15 years, uh, which makes it more difficult to break the habit? Um, the most effective solution, like I said, the, most, the first line, the gold standard of treatment is habit reversal therapy. Um, so really, I would suggest um, doing something probably therapist guided. Um, so, for example, um, using trick stop um, and using that with a therapist um, or going to see a therapist um, that is an expert in treating trichotillomania that can specifically uh, use uh, habit reversal therapy and then um, and, sorry, and then um, that they can um, help you with that and then tailor it specifically to you. The next question was, do you know what the most budget-friendly app is? Wow, um, I guess it depends. So first of all, Skin Pick and Trick Stop, they have a free version, so budget-friendly. Um, and then here also, um, Habit Now, if you're an Android user, it uh, people say the free uh, version is sufficient. Um, there is a free, there are free iPhone apps as well. I can look into those. Um, if you again want to send me an email, um, I can look that up for you. Um, have you heard of any integrated smartwatch apps that mimic the standalone devices? Um, 
I'm not sure if you're talking about the standalone devices of, oh, of the wearable devices. Great question. I don't know of any specific smartwatch apps that mimic it. Um, ideally, there should be, especially I believe there is a, I don't have a smartwatch app, but uh, a smartwatch, but I believe they have a motion detector in them. I'm not sure. That's a really good question. Um, yes, the event, uh, the next question was, has this event been recorded? Yes, it's being recorded and will be uh, uh, uploaded onto our um, website and our YouTube channel on skinpickandtrickstop.com. Um, we do have, uh, the next question was, is there a comorbidity between skin pick disorder and ADHD? I believe that we have a webinar specifically on this topic. Um, so you can look it up on our YouTube page. So the next question was, I've had trouble finding a therapist who understands my exploration disorder. I can't seem to find one who understands the complexity of skin picking. What should I have into account when finding a therapist? Um, that's a really great question. I would really ask for someone who um, is has the expertise in treating skin picking disorder. So somebody that um, has background and experience working with habit reversal training, because that really is the gold standard. Um, somebody that specifies for soul in CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, because that's really important for treating this disorder. Um, and again, like I said, so skin pick, um, skin pick uh, and trick stop. Uh, we have a program that is therapist assisted, therapist guided. Um, and so there, through the, our, our program, you will um, have access to an expert therapist uh, for skin picking disorder. So that's uh, my recommendation. Um, in terms of sending info by email, send me an email first. I'll put up my email again, and then um, I can send you with a specific question that you want answered, um, and then I can email it to you back. Um, the next question was, uh, can you share uh, the YouTube channel? Um, that is a really good point. I'll put it next webinar. We'll put it on our uh, Q and A slide also. But it's uh, if you look, type into YouTube either Skin Pick or Trick Shop, um, you will be able to find it. Um, I can read it for you here. Um, are there any more questions? Okay, so thank you everyone for attending. Um, and I hope that you have a great day.